guy, you know, that anybody who's, you know, the movie buffs will all recognize Sunset Boulevard, you know, that's mm. the movie, that old house, you know, with the swimming pool and everything, and just waving the... I just thought I described it pretty well with the musty feeling, yes. you know, <laughs> the smell. And <laughs> yep, they wouldn't believe it if, <laughs> unless it w it's just absolute truth. And it's very uh, did you ever, did you ever uh, look into the, uh, no. the, the oh. fate of the two, the two wives? Oh, Christ, do you think so? You mean nothing? <laughs> no way. True. We just got the hell out of there and left. I probably, I think it's probably true. We probably killed them both. Yeah, there's something. We may, have, we may have the beginning of a major scoop on that. I don't know. <coughs> when, was the, uh, when was the first time you saw Whitaker Chambers? Well, I remember the date very well. It was August the 3rd of 1948. Uh, on that occasion, he came before the Committee on Un-American Activities. Uh, I had not known before he came who he was or what uh, he was going to testify to. Uh, at that time, Bob Stripling, who was the committee's chief investigator, uh, was trying to find witnesses who might corroborate or dispute the testimony of, Eliz of Elizabeth Bentley, who had testified both before the Senate Committee, of which Bill Rogers was uh, the head uh, aide, and the House Committee on American Activities about a very broad infiltration of the federal government uh, by communists. Now let me explain here that in the year before that, in the years before that, uh, the Committee on Un-American Activities had had numbers of hearings about communist infiltration into other segments of American life. They had hearings on infiltration into Hollywood. I didn't participate too much in those hearings. Uh, that's the famous Hollywood 10. They were communists without question, uh, but uh, that was as about as far as it went. Whether or not they influenced movies was the question, and I, I think the ever. Weren't we? Uh, When was the first time you saw Whitaker Chambers? Well, the date was August 3rd, uh, 1948, uh, my second year in Congress. And he came before the committee uh, after Bob Stripling, our chief investigator, had made a search for witnesses who might corroborate, possibly, or dispute the testimony of Elizabeth Bentley, who had testified before the committee. This is the House on American Activities. House on American Activities Committee, who had testified before the committee uh, about a number of communists who she said had uh, infiltrated the government of the United States. Uh, now, uh, this opened an entirely new vista for the committee, before, because up to that time, including the time I was a member of it in 1947, uh, the committee was investigating communist infiltration of the motion picture industry, the famous Hollywood 10, into labor unions, uh, into education, uh, even into churches and that sort of thing, but never yet to any degree in government. Uh, so when uh, Mr. Chambers came before the committee, uh, and ran off a list of several that he said belonged to a communist group uh, in the government in the 30s. Uh, Lee Pressman, uh, who was the general counsel for the CIO, John Apt, Victor Perlow, etc. Uh, that was something new. But what was particularly new insofar as the press was concerned and insofar as uh, 
uh, we too on the committee were concerned was when he mentioned Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss, the mention of him uh, did not uh, particularly ring a bell with me at the moment, but it certainly did <laughs> shortly thereafter uh, because we got a wire from Alger Hiss uh, demanding to be heard by, by the committee and totally denying uh, Chambers' uh, uh, accusations. Uh, and so uh, we knew that uh, we had a problem on our hands. Here's a photograph of Chambers. Uh, what impressed you about him or how, how, did, how would you describe him? Uh, unkempt, disorderly, unimpressive, uh, except when he spoke. He spoke in a monotone, but uh, he was obviously a brilliant man, a genius without question. Uh, he, of course, was a senior editor of Time magazine, uh, had written some of their great editorials. Uh, Jim Shepley told me the greatest editorial ever written in life on religion was written by Whitaker Chambers. Was he a good witness? Uh, he was a good witness on the facts, not a good witness in terms of presenting them. He was just unimpressive. The next day, uh, as you say, you, you got the cable and uh, Hiss asked to come down. I think we have a photograph of Hiss testifying. What, uh, how did he impress you? What was your... Well, he impressed us exactly the opposite of Chambers, uh, and he impressed the press who were very much on his side, incidentally, and which made it easy for him. Uh, he impressed the press in exactly the same way. Uh, Hiss was, was good-looking, suave, sophisticated, uh, Ivy League dressed, Ivy League manner. Uh, he was everything that an elegant uh, uh, Washington executive should be in the New Deal era. Uh, and uh, with his clipped words and his very professional way of answering questions in a very careful way, he was a very effective witness. What did he say? Well, he said he'd never known a man by the name of Whitaker Chambers, that it was totally false, uh, that he was uh, mystified by how it happened, and uh, of course demanded that the committee uh, clear his name, in effect. How did, what did you then do? Well, the fat was in the fire. Uh, the, the committee was in uh, virtually panic. I remember we had a meeting thereafter, and we all said to Stripling, how did we get into this box? And Stripling said, well, he had checked Chambers out, and Chambers had a good reputation uh, that uh, he felt that he uh, seemed to be a credible witness. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the other members of the committee said, look, the committee's got enough problems. Let's drop this case uh, and get on with something else. And I must say that I was uh, very disturbed myself because right after the committee's hearings, I went to the house dining room, uh, the old house dining room, I should say. And there they used to have a round table where all the Republicans used to sit around the table together. And I sat there, and Joe Martin was there on that occasion in Halleck. And a reporter from the Chicago Daily News came in. He was a, not a left-winger at all. He, in fact, I considered him one of the most fair and objective uh, reporters who was covering the committee's activities. And he was virtually shaking with rage. His face was all red. And he said, this is the most terrible thing, that you would allow that man Chambers to come in and testify against his without seeing whether or not Chambers knew the man. You should have done it in executive session. Well, of course, I was pretty shaken by that, too, because here I was, a young congressman, uh, uh, trying to do a good job, uh, with a committee that I knew had a reputation for irresponsibility already. And so I must be say I was tempted to do what most of the committee wanted to do, drop the case and get on with something else and admit that we were wrong. But somehow I remembered. I had a feeling. You know, sometimes it's like gut instincts you've got. Any successful politician's got to have gut instincts. He's never going to make it. And I said, there's something about that fellow that doesn't ring true. And then I began to think of it. He was too smooth. Uh, you know, the British have a saying that uh, he's too clever by half. And I thought, why was it that he was so careful when he said, I have never known a man by the name of Whitaker Chambers? He didn't ever say that he didn't know Whitaker Chambers. Uh, and uh, I felt, too, that he gave the appearance of one who 
was trying to make his case from a legal standpoint. Some way it didn't ring true, uh, but I couldn't be sure uh, because I thought maybe it was just his manner uh, that had made me suspicious and not the substance of what he said. So I asked the committee chairman, Parnell Tom, I said, let's take some days off. Uh, he says, well, you want to take the responsibility? And I said, I would. So he appointed me chairman of a subcommittee to question chambers further. And so I was the chairman of the subcommittee, and we went to New York. Uh, there were two other members of the committee who went with me. Uh, and uh, we went up to New York, and I spent the whole night, the night before we got there, on the 5th, or the 7th, I should say. See, Chambers appeared on the 3rd. Uh, Hiss appeared on the 5th and denied it all and said he didn't know Chambers. And then on the 7th, we were in New York at the uh, Foley Square building, where I now have an office. Uh, he then came before us, Chambers came before us. I spent the whole night before the hearing uh, putting down questions of everything that one man would know about another if he really knew him. And I took Chambers over that ground. Two hours of it. I grilled him. What kind of questions did you? Uh, what did he look like? Uh, uh, what did his wife look like? Uh, where did he live? Uh, can you describe his houses? What were his eating habits? What did he like? What kind of clothes did he wear? Did he have a car? Uh, what were his hobbies? And the answers came back in a matter of fact, uh, not exciting way, but that made it even more impressive. Chambers, it seemed to me, was talking about somebody he knew. Uh, and uh, when we came to uh, what are his hobbies, for example, he said, well, he was an amateur uh, ornithologist. Uh, and then he said, his eyes lighting up, he said, uh, uh, I remember how excited he was one day uh, when he came back to the apartment in which uh, we were both uh, living at that time and said that he had seen a prothonotary warbler uh, on a walk down uh, through a Washington area by the canal. And that didn't sound like a man who just studied the other fellow and said, well, he's an ornithologist. But it sounded like somebody who was recounting a conversation that he'd had. Well, so it went. So under those circumstances, I felt that we had at least a prima facie case that indicated that Chambers knew enough about him that he must have known him. And uh, I wasn't satisfied, however, so I went up to see Chambers at his farm. And I remember sitting on the porch of his farm with him, and he was sitting there with uh, wearing galluses and uh, very unkempt, no way that you imagine the present day uh, elite class of time senior editors looking all spruced up in their fancy clothes, ready to go out to the next cocktail party and that sort of thing. And uh, so Chambers uh, was talking to me about uh, things in general, and I mentioned the fact that uh, I happen to be a Quaker and he said, you know, Mrs. Hiss was a Quaker, too. And then uh, he snapped his finger, and he said, you know, this is, reminds me of something else. I remember when she talked to Alger, she might often use the plain speech. Now, I was a Quaker. Chambers was a Quaker convert. And I knew that anybody who uses the plain speech, of course, to use that term, you had to know what it meant. But beyond that, it was the way he said it, uh, not the fact that he knew that she was a Quaker, but the way he said, uh, said it that indicated to me that he was talking about somebody he knew rather than somebody he'd read about and studied for the purpose for some dark, evil reason in, his, in the recesses of his mind was trying to uh, do in. So we went back uh, again, uh, this time to Hiss. Uh, I, as chairman of the subcommittee, was calling the signals at this point. We went over the same ground with him. And as the answers came back from him with regard to the places he lived, with regard to uh, his car, with regard to all of these matters, uh, uh, we uh, recognized that uh, uh, he, that Chambers had been right. Uh, we asked him, for example, what his hobbies were. And then McDowell, uh, Congressman McDowell of Pennsylvania, uh, when Hiss said that uh, he liked birds, uh, he was an amateur ornithologist, uh, McDowell said, uh, oh, that's interesting. And he leaned forward in his way and he says, you know, uh, 
I'm fond of birds too. He said, tell me, did you ever see a prothonotary warbler? And he said, oh yes, I have, down on the canal. He says, a beautiful bird with uh, yellow uh, coloring and so forth. And there was silence in the committee room because that's exactly what Chambers had said. Well, it still didn't prove the case because it was always possible that Chambers had studied his life and made it all up uh, so that it would fit into the pattern. Uh, so uh, as we went along there, it uh, finally uh, uh, Hiss realized that we were on to something. And he finally said that it's possible that this man, Chambers, uh, was the same man as a George Crossley, a freelance writer he used to know for the Nye Committee that used when uh, used to know when Hiss was a, uh, one of the uh, staff people working for the Nye Committee on Disarmament. Uh, and uh, uh, he had known him then. And it might be that this Chambers was the same fellow as this Crosley, a deadbeat uh, who had stayed in his uh, apartment on one occasion. He just gave it to him, loaned it to him, and then he'd thrown him out because he wouldn't pay the rent. Uh, in other words, our pointing out to uh, Hiss that Chambers knew all these things about him put him on notice that he had to find some way uh, to explain how somebody could have known all these things. And so he invented, as it turned out later, the name Crossley. When was the first uh, public confrontation between the two? Far more important than the public confrontation, which was on August the 25th, was the private confrontation. Uh, that was what broke open the Hiss case, broke it o open and set in motion a chain of circumstances which eventually brought Hiss's indictment and his conviction of perjury. Where was that? Took place in room 1400 of the Commodore Hotel. In uh, New York? In New York. Uh, we had Hiss uh, and uh, Chambers both invited to come there. And uh, they were in the room, uh, uh, Hiss was in the room first. And uh, he was seated there. I pulled the blinds open so that there would be no problem in terms of identification when the two were to meet for the first time. and. Uh, uh, so uh, after Hiss uh, had sat down, I called the committee to uh, order, and then I told Lou Russell, who was the committee investigator, one of them, to bring Chambers into the room. And he brought Chambers into the room. And as Chambers came into the room, one thing occurred to me right away. Not once did Hiss turn around to look at this man that he said he had never seen before, that he didn't know. He just stared straight ahead. That told me something, but I didn't want to judge too quickly. So I asked uh, Hiss to stand, and I asked uh, Chambers to remain standing. And then I said to Hiss, now this man is Whitaker Chamber. I ask you, have you ever seen this man before? And Hiss said, uh, well, would you ask him to say something? And Chambers said, well, I said to Chambers, will you please state your name? Your occupation. He said, uh, my name is Whitaker Chambers. Hiss interrupted. He said, uh, W would you ask him to open his mouth wider? And uh, no. Uh, he said, uh, would, you, would, would you ask him to, re to say something more? Uh, and so I found a copy of Newsweek magazine that was there on the table, and I had Chambers read from that. And after he'd read a while, Hiss said, uh, could he uh, open his mouth wider? And he turned to me and said, you know what I mean, Mr. Nixon? I want to look at his teeth. And so Chambers opened his mouth, and he said, uh, I remember that the Crosley that I knew had very bad teeth. I wonder if you'd ask him, Mr. Nixon, if he's ever had anything done to his teeth. And I said, have you, Mr. Chambers? And Chambers said, oh, yes, I've had considerable dentistry. And uh, 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 Hiss then said, well, uh, I said, then can you prepare to identify him then? He said, well, no, I wonder if you could ask him the name of the dentist who did the work on his teeth. Chambers gave, gave the name of the dentist down in Maryland who'd done the work on his teeth. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, now, are you prepared to identify him? He said, uh, well, I, I can't make an identification yet. I would like to ask the, uh, to, to talk to the dentist to see what he has done. And then I broke it open right then. I said, Mr. Hiss, do you mean to tell me 
uh, that before you could identify this man, uh, you would have to check with his dentist to see exactly what he did to his teeth. And uh, Hiss changed the subject. And soon thereafter, uh, he agreed that this was the man he had known as George Crosley. Uh, then we had a public confrontation after that on the 25th, and that was on television. That was one of the most dramatic events of the time to that time, wasn't it? It, it was, was the it first. Was, it was the first televised, televised hearing yes. of any significance. I think it we was have very a, dramatic. Uh, I think we have a clip of that. And uh, so there they met uh, before the television cameras. Uh, it went on and on and on. Uh, what had happened was the press that was all in Hiss's corner after Hiss first came before the committee, not only because they thought Chambers was wrong, but because uh, Hiss uh, was more their favorite than Kennedy, that, uh, because they thought that Hiss was uh, more liberal, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, the press finally, after that hearing, began to change. Uh, because of the way that Hiss dodged and turned and so forth and so on. Uh, I once, for example, when we went through the dentist business in the public hearing, I said, tell me, Mr. Hiss, have you ever seen uh, Chambers with his mouth closed? He said, no, I only remember him when his mouth was open. And uh, everybody laughed and the chairman gaveled down and so forth and so on. And uh, the people in the press who had uh, been uh, very much uh, pro-Hiss began to get more and more concerned that maybe there was something wrong. What were some of the other uh, elements of the case that, uh, that led to his conviction? Well, for example, Chambers said that uh, the communist uh, operator who had worked with this ring of communists in the government, had given him a rug, uh, and it was established that Hiss did get a rug. Uh, Colonel Bykoff was his name. Uh, uh, one of the key elements was a car. Uh, Chambers had told how Hiss had given his car to a Communist Party operative uh, for the Communist Party at a time when he got a new one. Uh, Hiss had had to admit that he did, uh, that, that uh, he, had, he said he had sold Chambers a car, and then he said he'd loaned him a car. And finally, it turned out uh, that we found the uh, bill uh, of sale when he had uh, given the car, in effect, to this, uh, to, to this uh, car dealer who uh, turned out to, had a, to have a communist background. And uh, I remember when we showed the, the bill of uh, sale uh, to Hiss, we asked him if that is his, was his signature. Uh, it was, of course, a photostatic copy. And he said, well, could I see the original? And we said, well, you have to see the original in order to know that it's your signature, to be sure? He said, I could be surer. And the press tittered, the people in the audience. He began to lose them. And so it uh, went from then from bad to worse as far as he was concerned. It was obvious that he knew who Chambers was. Uh, it was obvious that, uh, uh, frankly, that uh, he had not been fully forthcoming in his testimony. When did the so-called pumpkin papers material emerge? That was later. Uh, the way that came about, uh, ironically, was uh, Hiss's friends proved to be his worst enemies. Uh, after this hearing, uh, Chambers went on Meet the Press. Somebody on Meet the Press asked Chambers whether or not Hiss uh, was a communist. And Chambers said, Alger Hiss was a communist and may still be. Uh, see, Hiss had said during the hearing uh, that uh, he wanted Chambers to make his charges public away from the privilege of a committee hearing uh, so that he could bring suit against him. He didn't bring suit for two weeks. And in the Washington Post, one of his greatest supporters had a sort of querulous editorial that said, in effect, put up or shut up. Uh, Mr. Hiss should sue. And so he did sue Chambers. Uh, after suing Chambers, what happened was uh, that the, uh, the, uh, there were depositions taken. And uh, the Hiss's lawyers were very, very rough on Mrs. Chambers. 
and made her cry. Uh, this is what Chambers recounted to me later. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the case took on a totally new dimension. New evidence came into being. What kind of new evidence? Well, the way it came into being is interesting. Uh, we had thought our part in the case was over. Uh, over because uh, we had brought the two together. We had destroyed uh, uh, his, incident, incident, uh, certainly so far as his veracity was concerned about uh, whether he knew Chambers or not. Uh, but on the other hand, we had uh, no further evidence of what, if anything, he had done as a communist. Uh, being a communist is one thing. Uh, uh, but uh, I remember one time we asked uh, Chambers in one of the hearings whether or not, as had been claimed by some of the pro-his people, if, if this weren't just a, a sort of a study group. And Chambers had answered, it was in no wise a study group. Its purpose was to infiltrate the government of the United States in the interest of the Soviet Union. But he didn't say how. Uh, in fact, he had denied, uh, in effect, uh, that it was an espionage group uh, in those hearings and others. So after... What would, what would have been the point of infiltration without espionage? It, it would be very hard, uh, well, to influence policy, to influence policy. Uh, in other words, to, to get a pro-communist policy in the Department of Agriculture and the Department of State and so forth. Uh, but espionage, of course, involves uh, spying and turning the information over to a foreign uh, uh, power. But going further then, after uh, this last deposition, uh, the lawyers for Hiss had demanded to, for Chambers, to Chambers, uh, that he produced some documentary evidence, some hard evidence, uh, proving that Hiss was a communist, proving that what he said was true. Now, this is a civil proceeding, you understand. So Hiss, uh, the Hiss's lawyer having done that, they had made a very grave mistake. Uh, they had underestimated Chambers. Chambers realized after they had cross-examined his wife so brutally that they would do nothing uh, without until they destroyed him. Uh, so he went up to New York. Uh, he had left some papers there, documents, uh, and other materials as well, uh, which uh, uh, had been uh, uh, turned over uh, to him and, and through him, of course, to uh, supposed to be turned over to uh, the top communist operative. Uh, he got them out and had taken them to the next deposition and turned them over uh, to the federal, uh, 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 turned them over to the defense lawyers, and the defense lawyers, of course, called in the Department of Justice. Now we're ahead of our story, ahead of our story because the next time we <coughs> heard about this, we in the committee, was that I, without knowing anything about Chambers having turned over this documentary evidence, these were several uh, score typewritten pages of uh, State Department documents and so forth. Uh, without our having known that, I saw a little article uh, in the Washington Daily News, the paper that's now defunct, uh, indicating that the Justice Department was about ready to drop the uh, his uh, chamber's case investigation. Uh, and then an article in another paper to the effect that the Justice Department was considering indicting Chambers for denying that uh, he uh, was uh, espionage, uh, engaged in espionage or what have you. So let's start again on that. Uh, I saw an item in the paper indicating that uh, the Justice Department was going to drop the His Chambers case, a very small one. So I got a hold of Stripling. We went up to see Chambers. I showed him this item. He said, that was what I was afraid was going to happen. He said, let me tell you something. I just dropped the bombshell uh, in a deposition hearing. And he said, what was the bombshell? He said, the judge has ordered us all to say nothing. Uh, I cannot say anything without risking contempt of court, so I can't tell you. I said, well, in view of this, however, uh, do you, I hope you haven't given them everything. Uh, he said, no, don't worry, I wouldn't be so foolish. Uh, I have another bombshell. 
And I said, let me tell you something. I don't know what the first one is, and I'm not going to ask you to be in contempt of court by telling us. But whatever the other bombshell is, you keep that. Don't give it to them. Uh, give that to the committee. We went back to Washington, all the way back, Stripling and I talked. What could the bombshell have been? Uh, we didn't think of espionage, uh, but we couldn't. We, we, it, we thought it had something to do uh, with tying his closer in to Communist Party membership, some way of proving it, uh, written way. In any event, uh, I came back, and uh, that following day I was to leave with Pat on a trip along with other congressmen to Panama. Uh, a junket, as a matter of fact, that was available to members of Congress at that time to go to Panama uh, after the Congress uh, recessed. Uh, I rather wondered, uh, actually, if I really should go, but I had canceled a vacation the year before when we had gone to the, on the Herder Committee trip. We hadn't had a vacation uh, for years, as a matter of fact, and I thought it was about time that I owed her one. So I decided to go ahead with it. But that night, I got Stripling in before I left, and I signed a subpoena for everything else that Chambers had. And I said, deliver this to Chambers. Have this served on him. Let's find out what else he has. So I took off with Pat. We got on the, the ship. Uh, and the next day, the whole thing broke wide open. I got a wire from Bert Andrews and another one who was covering the, the, the case for the New York Herald Who's Tribune. a reporter. A reporter from the New York Herald Tribune. Uh, a very fair reporter, one very interested in the outcome of the case, who had been following it from the beginning, and one of the very few reporters, one of about three out of a press corps of 50, who wasn't totally on his side. Uh, in any event, he said, you've got to come back, uh, because Stripling apparently had shown him the new evidence. I got one from Stripling. And uh, Forrestal, the Secretary of Defense, arranged to have a PBY uh, fly into a quiet lee side of an island near Cuba, I got off of this boat, was let down to, into a lifeboat, uh, which was rowed over to this uh, uh, flying boat and was flown back to Miami. I got into Miami, and as I got off the flying boat, there were all sorts of reporters around, and I said, Congressman, do you have any comments on the pumpkin papers? I said, pumpkin papers? What are you talking about? I thought it was a joke. And they said, well, they found some papers in a pumpkin at Whitaker Chambers Farm. And I said, oh my God, we really have a Lulu on our hands this time. I, I got into a DC-3. It uh, wasn't commercial. It was one of the Air Force DC-3s. Reminded me of my days in the Pacific. I sort of sat on a bucket seat, and all the way up I wondered, what in the world is this all about? I got in. Stripling met me. And he took me into the committee rooms, and there it was, a whole pile of documents, the copies of the typewritten documents that Chambers had turned over in the deposition hearing. And then the uh, uh, reels of tape uh, uh, of the, which were basically photostatic copies uh, of uh, papers uh, which were on microfilm. Uh, and uh, he had already had them developed. And so we looked through uh, those piles of tapes. And in them, th there were uh, certainly, I imagine, some innocuous things, but there were three, uh, three uh, pieces of paper with his handwriting on, in which he had summarized various State Department documents. Uh, and there were several of them were mar marked top secret. Uh, so we knew that we had there uh, certainly evidence, the hard evidence that we had lacked before, but evidence that went far beyond anything we'd even dreamed of. Before, we had thought of his being a communist, possibly even just a member of a study group, possibly simply a member of a group trying to, infil uh, trying to influence the policies of the United States in a way uh, that was more favorable to the Soviet Union, but never of espionage. Uh, and this involved espionage. How could the Truman Justice Department have ignored the implications for Hiss of the material the Chambers turned over at the first deposition hearing, given that Truman, uh, who was embarrassed by it politically, had dismissed it uh, at the very beginning as a red herring. But as the evidence against Hiss grew and as his partisans began to fall away, uh, did the Truman attitude change or the attitude of the Justice Department? The Justice Department was in a box here. I mean, after all, it was a political administration. 
an election was coming up within a matter of months. This is August of 1948. And uh, uh, Truman honestly felt that the committee was a disaster, or that uh, he felt that it had been irresponsible in times past. Uh, he felt that, as he put it, that it was a red herring, a red herring in order to divert attention from the failures of what he called uh, the terrible Republican 80th Congress, of which I was a member. Uh, that's what he honestly felt. Uh, Truman was certainly not pro-communist in any manner, uh, manner of means. He was a strong anti-communist. Uh, I don't think he had any brief to carry for his. But on the other hand, he was caught in a terrible dilemma. Uh, he had called this com these committee hearings a red herring after the first hearings, when it appeared that his was going to come through scot-free and the committee was going to be embarrassed. And now, as a good politician, he felt as a good politician, he had to stick to it. Uh, he did stick to it, and the Justice Department at least played his game for a while. But we forced their hands, and Chambers forced their hands, by coming up with this new evidence. And from that time on, the press, even though it was strongly pro-his, uh, first because it was a big news story, but second because uh, they felt they had some responsibility in the matter, they kept hammering and hammering until finally uh, justice was done. I think Truman ever changed his mind? About Hiss's guilt? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, if he had any. Uh, about whether the committee was engaged in uh, a red herring activity? No. I have a, I think one of my most interesting recollections was a conversation I had with Bert Andrews, who had sources not only within the committee, but within the White House itself, because he was considered to be one of the top reporters in Washington in those days. He was the chief of the bureau for the New York Herald Tribune. He was very critical of the committee, too, wasn't he? He had written a book that had won him a prize in which he had given the committee the devil uh, for some of its procedures uh, in government loyalty checks. Uh, and he had given the State Department the devil for the same thing, for, for firing some people and forcing some people to leave because of the loyalty issue. So therefore, his credentials were very good in that respect. But he was an honest reporter. Uh, but he had a line within the White House, and he said, that his source within the White House was in the Oval Office when a Justice Department representative took some of these documents in to show them to Truman, uh, the so-called pumpkin papers, the reproductions of the documents on microfilm, and the typewritten papers and the rest, which were later proved to have been written on a typewriter by Priscilla Hiss, uh, which Hiss is his own. That was another one of the physical things. You see, the typewriter, the rug, the car, these physical things were the hard evidence that brought him down. Uh, and when Truman saw these documents, he looked at them and he got angrier and angrier. And then he started to pace the floor according to the aid who was there. And he said, the son of a bitch, he betrayed his country. The son of a bitch, he betrayed his country. That's how he felt about his. But he went out in a press conference, uh, no, but then, not in a press conference, but then the aide said, well, are you going to uh, change your evaluation as far as this hearing is concerned. Not at all, not at all. He said, uh, uh, as far as that committee is concerned, uh, they aren't interested in, in uh, his. Uh, they're simply interested in uh, uh, discrediting this administration. These hearings, the purpose of them is a red herring. And he went r out even after that and told a press conference he still considered the hearings to be a red herring. Even after it became public knowledge, uh, when Hiss had to back down and said, yes, he had known Chambers, even though he claimed he had known him as Crosley. Uh, even after the papers came out, which indicated that Hiss uh, very possibly had been involved in espionage, and later, of course, it was proved by a jury, or admitted by a jury, or held by a jury that he had been. He was convicted he, of perjury. That's right. Truman never changed his view that the committee's hearings were a red herring because he was referring to our intent, which he considered to be political. Uh, and he ignored what we finally had brought to public uh, attention, the fact that he was guilty. Alger Hiss is still trying to uh, exonerate himself. How do you think that's possible? How can one, for all these years, in the face of such overwhelming evidence and the uh, uh, conviction uh, by a jury, how can he do this? Can he still believe in his innocence? Well, uh, he may believe in his innocence. I don't think he does believe in his innocence because uh, 
uh, I believe, is uh, the one who started out as very pro Hiss, Alan Weinstein, uh, came down on the other side with the conviction that Hiss had been guilty of perjury. I believe that he was, and that Hiss knows it. Uh, but this is uh, the man who wrote the book about the uh, right. perjury about that's the right. Hiss Chambers case. Uh, a, uh, a professor. Uh, I think that as far as Hiss is concerned, it's. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a really able to judge his uh, motives, except he's determined to stand by what uh, he said so many years ago. How did you feel when he was uh, reinstituted by the Massachusetts Bar a couple of years ago? Not surprised. Uh, you have to understand that uh, the Hiss case, you see, went far beyond, far beyond uh, the usual congressional investigation of communist subversives or what have you, or even espionage. Uh, the Hiss case was considered by Hiss's supporters and defenders as being an attack uh, on the whole elite establishment, an attack on the Foreign Service of the United States, an attack on those who were for the UN, attack on the Roosevelt foreign policy. I recall, for example, being at a dinner at uh, Virginia Bacon's house in Washington, D.C. She was one of the great hostesses, and Paul Porter was there, a, a good liberal uh, uh, Truman Democrat, and uh, uh, this was right after the pumpkin papers had come out, and somebody was needling Porter a little because they knew he had been strongly pro hiss Well, now, uh, don't you believe, uh, aren't you going to have to admit that, uh, that the committee has done uh, an honest job, at least, and a good job in exposing this? And he said no. He says, I think these committees, this committee's hearings, the Un-American Activity Committee's hearings were a disaster. I think they were very detrimental to the country uh, because they cast reflections on the Roosevelt foreign policy. Well, of course they cast reflections on the Roosevelt foreign policy, but that it seemed to me for a lawyer to say went a bit far. But that was perhaps typical, typical of people in the Foreign Service, typical of people and particularly uh, those who were very closely associated with Harvard and the other great universities, to find a fellow like Hiss uh, being involved in this sort of thing. Uh, if it had been the other way around, if it had been Chambers, this rather unkempt, uh, rather disorderly looking fellow with the poor teeth and the rest, uh, uh, not in the top social set, if he had been the one, uh, I do not think you would have had the same reaction. Uh, but. Then and even now, years later, I think people think that they identify me as one who attacked the establishment, uh, helped to bring, uh, unfortunately, uh, some disrepute to the whole uh, foreign policy establishment of the United States. Let me read you a, uh, a short quote from Lillian Hellman, uh, writing in one of her books about uh, this time, about the anti-communist uh, atmosphere, led first by the House on American Activities Committee and then by uh, Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy. She wrote, it is now sad to read the anti-communist writers and intellectuals of those times, but sad is a fake word for me to be using. I am still angry that their reason for disagreeing with McCarthy was too often his crude methods. Such people would have a right to say that I, and many like me, took too long to see what was going on in the Soviet Union. But whatever our mistakes, I do not believe we did our country any harm, and I think they did. Do you believe that the people uh, that were uh, investigated and criticized by the House on American Activities Committee and the McCarthy uh, investigations did harm to the country? I think that I would put it another way, uh, taking Ms. Hellman's uh, point of view, uh, that when she says that those who were communist, who did infiltrate the government of the United States, and in some cases did turn over uh, information to the Soviet Union, as the Atom spies did, for example. Uh, I think they did very great harm to the United States. Uh, I, of course, as you know, uh, did not agree with McCarthy's methods. Uh, I did my very best to get him to be more responsible, uh, but was unable to bring him into line. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I have no apologies for whatever for the work we did on the Hiss case. Uh, one of the reasons that Eisenhower said that he selected me for a running mate was, he, was that uh, he was impressed by, my, by what I had done in the Hiss case because I got him, but got him fairly. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, let me say it wasn't that personal. It wasn't just me. Others participated in it too. Uh, but uh, those who say uh, that, uh, well, it doesn't, it isn't going to make any difference if there are a few communists in the State Department and pass this little bit of information to the other to the Soviet Union, it makes a very great deal of difference because that's part of a whole Soviet uh, move, not only toward the United States, but every place else in the world. Uh, espionage, subversion, subversion for the purpose of influencing policy. That's part of the Soviet Union's great objective. And we have to be on guard in a responsible way to see that people under their control, influenced by them, even innocently influenced, uh, do, are not in government positions. How widespread do you think communist infiltration in the government was in those years, in the pre-war and immediately post-war years? Very significantly, uh, particularly during the period of, the, of, uh, of World War II, uh, when we were allies. Uh, then, frankly, it was considered uh, uh, proper, even fashionable, uh, you know, to take a sort of a pro-Soviet uh, line. Uh, thereafter, uh, it became uh, certainly uh, less uh, fashionable, shall I say, and uh, it became legally dangerous to do so uh, because uh, the Soviet Union during the Cold War period was considered to be a potential enemy of the United States. But there is no question that there was infiltration. And uh, there is no question, in my view, that Truman's loyalty checks, which were carried on by Eisenhower, uh, that they were necessary. Some of them were not, perhaps, conducted in a way that uh, uh, would meet all the standards that we would have liked. Uh, but something had to be done. You just couldn't leave those people in those positions. And as you know, for every Hiss who was uh, exposed, found guilty, and went to prison, there are many others who left office because they didn't want it, uh, to, frankly, testify or sign a loyalty oath or what have you. Do you think that there is communist infiltration in the government today? Oh, I would not be surprised. Uh, let me put it this way. I would be surprised if there were not. Uh, I would say that uh, I do not think it is widespread uh, because, uh, after all, uh, both the Republicans and the Democrats uh, know that in terms of a political issue, it would be dynamite to have a high appointee or even a low one uh, be exposed for any communist activities. Uh, but certainly, uh, don't think for one moment that the communists don't continue to try, not only in government, uh, but in business and so forth. Let me say, at the present time, one of the grave problems we have is industrial espionage. I mean, you, we read of cases every day, every few days here, you know, of industrial ep espionage or uh, this one or that one who uh, turned over information. Uh, that's part of the, uh, of the whole uh, thrust of Soviet foreign policy. Did you address the problem when you were president? Not specifically. I was too, frankly, busy uh, trying to uh, handle the foreign policy problems that we had dealing with the Soviet Union, at the very highest level, uh, dealing with China, uh, dealing, dealing with the Mideast, and of course the primary concern, at least for the first four years of ending the war in Vietnam in an honorable way. Uh, as far as communism within the government was concerned, uh, communist activities or industrial espionage and so forth, uh, I did not uh, take any personal role in that. I didn't have any time to concentrate on it. In view of the way the communist empire uh, uh, has, uh, un has uh, imposed itself since the post-war years, since the dropping of the Iron Curtain, and uh, since uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968, since Afghanistan, since Poland, how is it possible for someone in the West today who enjoys the freedom that, uh, that goes with living in the West, and particularly in the United States, to be a spy for the Soviet Union? Unless it's, unless it's purely for money, but in, is, is it, how is it possible to be an ideological communist with one's allegiance in Moscow today? Hard to understand, but it happens. I guess it happens because there are people, particularly among the intellectual people, this idea that communists are all working stiffs or minorities and the rest is just fatuous nonsense. That isn't the case. There are few in those areas. Uh, primarily, the communists 
in most countries are the intellectuals. They're the better educated people. They're the idealists and so forth. But they're the idealists who have given up uh, on Western society, given up on U.S. democracy, on European democracy and whatever. In fact, Foster Dulles, uh, who was one of those who had vouched for Hiss when Hiss was named uh, the uh, president of the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace, of which Dulles was one of the trustees. Uh, Foster Dulles, after Hiss's conviction, made a very eloquent statement uh, where he said, the great tragedy of the Hiss case, I will paraphrase it, uh, is that our uh, ideals no longer have the appeal to our young people that they should have in order to retain their loyalty. Uh, and that's the key to it. It's, it's le but let me say it is a real problem. There are, there are numbers of people in the intellectuals uh, community uh, who see the danger on the left, on the right, uh, but do not see a danger on the left. And, and they, they think that all liberation or revolutionary movement uh, against any what they call a dictatorial society, authoritarian or other ways on the right, should be supported. Uh, even like, for example, uh, uh, similar to that is the way the, that most of the American establishment, uh, many in the American establishment, came down on the side of the North Vietnamese communists, uh, who were among the most brutal, vicious people, uh, aggressors in the history of uh, civilization. And they proved it, of course, since they moved into South Vietnam, and since their colleagues uh, had moved into Cambodia and slaughtered three million Cambodians. Uh, but uh, it's something I can't explain. One of the uh, uh, statements from Chambers' testimony, one of his several testimonies before the committee, that you used to use in speeches uh, at the time had to do with, uh, was really his, uh, Chambers' summation of the web they had become trapped I, I recall, I think, I think I know the one you're speaking of, but let me tell you how that came about. I was trying to find out what might have motivated Chambers, uh, because uh, uh, Hiss's defenders, this is after Hiss denied that he knew him, said, well, Chambers must have had a grudge against him. Uh, uh, Chambers has got to got, have some secret hatred for this man that would make him do this sort of thing. And one time, sitting up there at Chambers' farm on the porch, I said, uh, I caught him, tried to catch him unaware, and I said, tell me, I said, uh, what do you say to the charge that people say that you're doing all this because uh, you've got some secret uh, beef against tr uh, uh, Hiss, uh, something growing out of your relationships in the past? And uh, he said, how could I have any motive which would lead me to destroy myself? And that seemed to be an answer. And so uh, when he came before the committee, uh, in that long session. It lasted about six hours, as I recall. Chambers was on, Hiss was on, and it got late in the day. It was about five o'clock. We were tired. The press was tired. I'm sure Chambers was. And, and, and I finally asked him the critical question. I said, Mr. Chambers, will you tell this committee, is there some motive you have, uh, some uh, motive of revenge that has led you to testify against Mr. Hiss as you have. And then he answered. I have a, and I think, I have a copy uh, if you'd read I it. I think I can uh, remember it, but uh, if I could have it. He answered in his usual monotone. Uh, but it is per perhaps the most moving statement I've ever heard before a committee. The story has spread that in testifying against Mr. Hiss, I am working out some old grudge or motives of revenge or hatred. I do not hate Mr. Hiss. We were close friends, but we are caught in a tragedy of history. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy against which we are all fighting, and I am fighting. I have testified against him with remorse and pity. But in a moment of history in which this nation now stands, so help me God, I cannot do otherwise. He completed the statement. There was a dead silence in the room for at least a minute. And anybody that heard that statement certainly was disabused, if he had it before, of any idea that Chambers had testified against Hiss because of some 
revenge motive. You went to the 1948 Republican Convention as a, not as a delegate, but as an honored guest as a member of Congress. You were a Stassen man, and you have subsequently said to friends that if you had been Stassen's campaign manager in 48, he would have won the presidency. Well, as a matter of fact, Stassen was the most interesting candidate. He was also one who could relate to World War II people because he had been a veteran uh, in World War II. He was young. He was charismatic. Uh, many people think since that time he was dull, but he really wasn't at that time. And he was smart, very, very smart. Uh, Dewey, uh, I think, was one of the most capable men ever to run for the presidency and would have made a great president without question or a great chief justice or anything. Uh, but no one would suggest that Dewey uh, could excite people, at least not in his later years. He didn't have that capability. Taft, another enormously capable man, uh, were an intellectual giant, uh, and a giant in terms of just sheer character and belief, and not a reactionary. As a matter of fact, Taft was a progressive. Uh, he was an isolationist, basically, deep down, uh, but he had very progressive advanced views on ed education, uh, on health care and on housing. In fact, some of the conservatives on the right uh, only stuck with him because they thought uh, he was more, shall we say, isolationist. Uh, and that, that held them in line. They didn't agree with his domestic views. And so there you had Taft, and there you had Dewey. Uh, I would say that of the, the, the lot that we had there at the convention, Stassen, if he could have been nominated, would have been the strongest candidate. I think he would have won. You weren't his manager uh, then, but Joe, oh, no. wasn't Joe McCarthy Joe was? Joe McCarthy was his floor manager. And I remember Joe McCarthy, after the Stassen had made his run for it and didn't get enough votes on the first ballot, and finally it went over to Dewey, uh, I saw him, I can remember vividly, at the entrance to the auditorium. Particularly, it's funny the things you remember, the sweat was just pouring down his cheeks and so forth, and his shirt was wet, and he was saying, uh, well, fellows, we've had it. There's no way that uh, Stassen can make it. And now let's go out and work for Dewey. Now let's understand that was a different time in McCarthy's history. He hadn't even thought of the communist issue then. I don't think he'd thought of it. Uh, he was engaged in other activities. He had come to the Senate, and we were good friends in 1946. Uh, the communist issue had not come up until later with him, after the 48 election. Was he sincere in his anti-communism? I've often thought about that question. And my answer is, at first, no. At first, I believe that uh, he just saw it as an opportunistic issue. Uh, he thought it was a good one after he saw what had happened in the Hiss case. And uh, he was uh, uh, making speeches. Uh, this is during the, uh, the campaigns, of course, that followed thereafter. Uh, and so he was making speeches and wanted to get a new lead for a speech and speaking out in West Virginia to a group of women. He threw out the fact that there are 50 communists in the State Department and then continued to up the number, referred to them as card carrying and so forth. Uh, and from then on, uh, it was almost impossible to restrain him and to make him be responsible. But once he got into it and once they began to take him on, he found there were some of those against whom he made, made charges, who were actually guilty. Uh, and that, of course, uh, made him, I think, deeply sincere about those. But at the beginning, no. He started with opportunism, uh, ended with extremism, and his extremism destroyed him. The controversy that surrounded the his case must have been very tough and rough, not just on you, but on, uh, on Mrs. Nixon as well. Did you consider leaving politics after uh, 48 or after the, your term, your 48 term ended in 1950? Not then. Uh, at a later time uh, in uh, 1954, after we went through a brutal campaign and it didn't seem to uh, uh, get us any credit, uh, we just seemed to take slings and arrows from everybody, although we knew we'd done a good job and probably saved a few seats, as the Gallup poll indicated we had by our campaigning. Then I was very depressed, and Mrs. Nixon was relieved when I indicated uh, 
in our house at 4801 Tilden Street one time around the fireplace. Well, this was the last campaign. Uh, after this one, I must say, though, taking the his case on was not pleasant. It was not something I welcomed doing. Uh, after all, I had, I had come to Congress. I was quite respected as a congressman, uh, not universally liked because I was a conservative among a liberal media sect and so forth, but people consider me a responsible conservative. Uh, I had joined a group uh, uh, along with Jack Javits, uh, headed by Russell Davenport for forward-looking programs for health and in other areas. Uh, I'd been on the Herder Committee and had made very effective speeches for foreign aid. Uh, I had supported the Greek-Turkish aid program. I had supported reciprocal trade. I had supported the Marshall Plan. Uh, I was considered to be a responsible internationalist in foreign policy. Uh, it seemed to me I had a very, a very good career and a uh, relatively non-controversial career, career. And everybody likes to be kind of non-controversial. You don't like to get up in the morning and see a Herb Block cartoon showing you climbing out of a sewer. Uh, and he had worse on occasion with me. Uh, you don't like your family to see it because children grow up and those images become in seared onto their brains and in their minds and their souls. Uh, and so after the Hiss case, uh, the Hiss case certainly uh, uh, left a great mark on all of us because uh, what happened there uh, was that many people in the media never forgave me for that. Uh, I'm not critical of them. I understand why. They, they, they thought some way that I was attacking their whole way of life, what they stood for and so forth. I mean, they weren't communist. Uh, they probably disapproved, if they thought he was guilty at all, of what Hiss had been charged with at least. Uh, but on the other hand, they just didn't like the idea of uh, somebody coming along and uh, demonstrating uh, that there was some communist infiltration in the government. I think. I think Herbert Hoover uh, perhaps uh, hit a raw nerve when he wired me right after Hiss was convicted. And I think I can recall the wire exactly when he said, uh, congratulations on uh, the result in the Hiss case. He said, uh, the, the stream of treason uh, in our government has finally been exposed for all to see in a way they understand. So he thought, in other words, that there had been a stream of, uh, of treason. Others thought it. Uh, but there were many others who perhaps, like Paul Porter, if there was a stream of treason, they thought it was time to forget it and to go on to other things. Thank you.